First things first, I want to inform you that this webinar training is being recorded. So if you happen to post a question in the chat box and or unmute yourself or take your camera off, please know that this webinar is being recorded. We have a few more folks in the waiting room and we will let them in, but just due to time, I wanna be sure that we honor your time as well as make sure we get through the material that we have for you today. So we're gonna jump right in. Welcome to our ARP eSurf 3 application training. We have our Office of Federal Emergency Relief team here to support you. Just a couple quick introductions. If you wanna put your name and some information in the chat box so we collectively know who our community is that we're engaging with today, that would be great. My name, as you may know, is Shelly Shassi Jandro. I am the Director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs. And I'll let the rest of our teammates introduce themselves. Well, good morning. I'm Karen Kusiak, and I coordinate the ESER 1 and ESER 2 applications or funding streams and also CRF 2 and CRF reallocated. Good morning, everyone. I'm Monique Sullivan, I'm the new ARP coordinator. Um, as I said earlier, um, last week, some of you may uh, remember me from Title I, so I'm back during federal programming. So welcome. And we also have currently one more team member who is not with us this morning, Nicole Dennis. She supports all of our business managers and the financial component associated with our work. So we encourage you, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat box. Our team will be monitoring the chat box to the best of our ability. We will also have some natural breaks within the presentation that Monique is doing this morning so that you can unmute yourself and ask any questions and follow up items that you may have. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Again, good morning, everyone. Um, we are recording this, so um, don't feel like you have to catch everything when I say it. You can go back and review the recording. I wanna set a couple of um, <clears throat> kind of uh, caveats. There's a lot in this webinar. I know I have a very short amount of time trying to do it within about 40 minutes to leave time for questions. Um, there may be some slides that I just kind of skip over or um, kind of just breeze through because they're not what I really want to focus on. Uh, basically, the way the um, PowerPoint is set up or the slide is set up is that just giving you an overview, kind of like a visual point to see what you're going to be looking at when you look at the application. There's no expectation for you to read some of these screenshots. Some of them are really tiny. The print is really tiny. So please don't try to read them on the slide. Um, that is not the intent. It's just to give you an overview, kind of a visual of what it's gonna look like. Um, and I anticipate having some future um, either technical assistance webinars or uh, content specific webinars, um, depending on the questions or the needs that come about um, as districts are starting to look at their, or starting to think about their um, ARPS or three funds. Um, and it, this, it is due um, at the end of September. So this, you do have a few months to think about what, how you're going to do that and how you're going to, um, to fund um, and use the funds. So think about that as well. And it is summer. So I hope you guys can have a little bit of summer. So our intent is not for you to spend it all working on um, your ARPS or application. So to go ahead and get started, and again, put your questions in the chat. Um, we'll try to get to them as we can. If not, we'll definitely put, um, when we post the, um, this recording, we will look at the chat questions and, uh, and uh, respond to them appropriately as best we can. Um, and as you guys know, everything keeps changing, so just bear with us. Um, so again, just to review the, the ARP, the purpose of ARP ESSER funding, um, it's to implement um, prevention and mitigation strategies um, aligned with CDC guidance to the greatest extent practicable. Um, and then the other piece, which is a little bit different than the other, the CARES and CARISA um, funding, and that is, it's really to address the academic impacts of lost instructional time through evidence-based interventions um, that respond to the academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs of all students, but particularly your, your most underserved students. Um, so that's something to think about that's a little bit different than the other um, uh, you know, CARES and CRF monies and also the CRISA monies. So this is just to give you an overview. I know some of you are like, we already did some stuff for ARP. 
yes, you were um, part of the requirements for ARP was to do a data collection survey, which was due back in uh, May. So um, most of you did that. I think there are a few that are a little bit left outstanding and working with them directly to help them get that in there. You also had to complete part one, which was the terms and conditions and assurances, which you did again in May. Um, now what this webinar is gonna focus on is part two. Um, that application is now um, on um, and read, it's ready for you to start working on. So there's a couple pieces of that. There's the cover sheet and assurances. Um, there is the identifying the SAU um, overall priorities and consultation. Um, you will need to provide some information about your plan for safe return to in-person instruction. Um, and then you have to have a 20% set aside, which needs to be focused on addressing the impact of academic, uh, addressing the um, impact, um, the academic impact of the lost uh, instructional time. Um, and then you also need to Whatever's left over after the 20% um, reservation, you'll build some, pro, um, some other projects that um, fall along the allowable uses of ARP funding. So um, again, we're going to be using um, the GEM system. Uh, many of you who are former ESEA or do ESEA work, that's what they've used in the past. So we're using that same uh, software platform. Um, it's www.4pcmain.org. Again, I know the screenshots are kind of tiny. It's just to give you a visual reference point. You'll go in, you'll log in. It's the same login that you've used for your other um, uh, gem, um, applications. You'll go down to the bottom. You'll pick your American Rescue Plan um, SR3. Um, and then when you click on that, you'll come up with the right hand um, screenshot and you'll see all the different pieces that we talked about the general instructions the um you know the uh the application um setup um and then all the other pieces that go with the application um again it's not as complicated as some of the other applications that some of you use like title the esea um there isn't a lot to this so you pretty much are going to stay on the data entry side, but I just circled it and highlighted it just to make sure that you're on that side. If you're on the submission side, it's not going to look anything like this. So you're going to know you're on the wrong, um, you're on the wrong slide. So again, you can look at the general direction or directions. Um, you can also go, and I didn't highlight it, but there's also technical directions, which is a PDF, which um, I also uh, put a link on the end of this webinar, which, um, sorry, at the end of the slide um, presentation, which you can go, and it's just more general um, directions on how to navigate and what to do, kind of problem solve. But I did, uh, reference a little bit of that in this presentation, so um, you can go back and forth. But you're going to go to the application setup page. <clears throat> I'll let that go there. And basically, you want to make sure that you have all the information in there. The first part of it is your superintendent information. Um, you want to make sure your superintendent information is accurate, uh, because when you're ready to submit this application, this is the information that will be used. That email address will be the one that um, the certification page is sent to or the notification is sent to. So if the email is incorrect and your superintendent is saying, hey, I didn't get the certification, go back and check to make sure that that email is correct um, so that, um, that your superintendent can get that certification page. Um, below that, you also, oh, and then you also need to check yes if you are going to be, uh, um, applying for these funds. Now, again, some of you already did this when you did your part one and you already did your certification and assurances, but we're just reviewing it again for anybody who may be coming on new um, that didn't do the part one and may not be familiar with it. Um, and then you also wanna make sure your applicant coordinator position, all that information is correct too, because any notifications that go out are gonna also go to this person as well. So make sure that your, especially your email is um, correct. And again, just like with other um, GEM uh, platform applications, you wanna make sure you save uh, before you go on to the next page. Uh, and then the next page is the uh, application um, cover sheet and assurances. Again, some of you may have already filled this out when you um, did the kind of the first, 
first part one, but I wanted to review that as well. So the cover sheet and signature, there's a lot on this, um, but a lot of it is auto-populated based on what you put in your setup page. So if there's something that's incorrect or doesn't look right, go back to your application setup page because that's where it's pulling the information from. Um, and then the signature um, and the date will be completed once your superintendent gets that certification notification. So when the superintendent gets it, signs it, then it will automatically update it on this cover sheet and signature sheet. I put it in there just so you can see it. And if you see the red down there, it's, it's because your superintendent hasn't signed off on your application that you have submitted. Any questions? Because that's going pretty quickly. Any questions on any of that? That's kind of basic information, but um, I don't see any, any in the chat. Okay. So the next is the assurances and certifications. And again, please do not try to read this. This is really tiny and the intent is not for you to read it during this presentation. It's just so you can see, there are basically five check boxes. Um, four of the check boxes are assurances. And yes, there are a lot because as you guys know, with federal funding, there's a lot of strings and these are all the strings that you're agreeing to when you accept these funds. Um, we did put in blue the, that the SAU, SAU is responsible for keeping all the documentation and evidence of the checked assurances. So when you check the box, we're not gonna, we're not gonna ask you to submit anything that says that you did this. We're just gonna assume that you're gonna keep all this evidence and documentation at your, um, at your district somewhere. So if we do get audited or you get audited, you can bring that information and show evidence of it. Uh, we're not gonna require it as a part. We're not gonna require the documentation as a part of the um, approval for, application, for the application. We're just gonna assume when you check off that you have that evidence. Um, um, and you also might want to read through them. Some of the CRFs are kind of um, interesting, but um, we're hoping that as we get through this process, that if we have to, we can have some separate um, webinars. Hopefully not, because this can get a little dry when you start going into that the government regulations. Also, make sure that when you are um, that last checkbox, um, that you uh, you know you agree to all of these, and that you save the cover sheet. So there's a question in the chat about the 20% reservation. Um, if you hold on to that question, we'll get to that when we get to that part of the um, slideshow. The next piece is um, the SAU overall priorities and consultation. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this because this is a little bit, I think, more in depth than the other um, CARES and CARISA funding that you guys have applied for and also some of the CRF funding that you've applied for. So again, there's a, a note that's in blue. Um, the SAU must keep evidence of the meaningful consultation with stakeholders and opportunities for public comment. So we're not gonna ask you to submit any of that in your application, but we're gonna make the assumption that when you're signing off on this, that you have evidence if asked or requested that you can show proof of that. So again, any questions that you have about the particulars of these requirements, um, and I know it sounds like I'm kind of being a little bit flippant, but we're not creating these up off the top of our head. These are requirements that have been um, mentioned either in the law, they're in their law itself, they're in um, the FAQs that the um, that US Department of Education has put out, or they're in the interim final rule, which we have a link to on the application. It's in blue um, on this page, but it's also in blue on the application. So if you have like, you know, you wanna read the actual um, language that was put out by the department, US Department of Education, you can click on that link. So you do need to check boxes that say which stakeholder groups um, that you met with. Um, it is a requirement that you um, meet with student, you have stakeholder, um, members that represent students, families, um, school and district administrators, teachers, principals, school leaders, 
all the people that are in your school community. And when you check off on this, this is also saying that you have, um, you've done meaningful consultation with them. You discussed the, the funds, how, you, how they're going to be used to um, you know, address the impact of COVID-19 on, on students um, learning and um, any kind of lost instructional time. Um, so I see a chat and a, qu a question in the chat that just popped up. Um, just give me a second and I will address that question as well. Um, and then you have 1A, which this means that you need to, to, to if you have, um, if you have any tribes or tri uh, students in your pop in your um, school community that are tribe that come from tribes, or you have some civil rights organizations, you need to include them as part of your stakeholder group as much as possible. I mean, if you're going out and spending tons and tons of time trying to access them and get them to be a part of it, that's different. But you need to make um, some effort to try to get them involved in there. But if you don't have any um, you know, um, students in your community that are from tribes or the tribal communities, then you don't have to have that in there. Um, and then you also need to make sure that you're representing the interest of other groups, children with disabilities, English learners, students in foster care, homeless, um, you know, migratory students. And the question in the chat is about incarcerated students. So if you don't have any incarcerated students, then no, you don't need to check that box. This is again, kind of that due diligence to make sure that you're really going out there and trying to make sure that you are getting the interest of all um, the pop student populations and the um, families in your community um, and that you're not just focusing on one particular group and that unless that's what your community um, says it's the need and Again, if you go back to the, like one of the original slides, the beginning slide, and that is you wanna look at which groups were the most impacted by COVID and then move like forward from that. And then the last question is about providing opportunity, um, public comment or public, providing opportunity for the public to have input into the, the, um, the SEU's application and that, Sometimes we also refer to that as how you're going to use the funds. So when we say application, it's also the same as how your plan for using the funds. So sometimes you'll see plan for use of funds, the use of how you're going to plan to, or the plan to use your funds. We also refer that as the application. So think of that as the application is what's your plan to how to use these funds um, and how did you provide public input or allow, provide, you know, allow the community to have some public input into that. Now, I know there's gonna be lots of questions about what does that physically look like? It's really gonna depend on your community. Um, I know a lot of you were very creative in getting public input um, when you were doing your ESCA plans. Um, you did a lot of different variations on that um, and you can use that as well. Um, some of you did in person, if it was allowable, met CDC guidelines. Um, some of you did webinars, some of you did surveys, some of you posted it on your website. Oh, you, Many of you got very creative with that as well. I just wanna check the... So there's a question about the civil rights or disability organizations. Um, there's the, Karen, you might be able to help me. I know I'm not gonna get the, way, uh, the name right, um, wrong, but there's the, the main disabilities. Um, the Parents Federation. There you go. <laughs> um, and uh, there, you know, you may have the ACLU, the main ACLU, uh, American Civil Liberties Union. Um, I don't know, like, I know there's ones that are in, it depends also where you are in, um, in the state. Um, there might be a little bit more activity, um, like in the more urban areas of the state versus the um, more suburban areas and more um, rural areas of the state. But this might be an opportunity for you to think about what organizations, civic organizations are out there that you might be able to contact um, and work with with these ARP funds as well. So the question is about for only organizations in your city or town, think of your school community and not necessarily your town or city. So if you're an RSU, you may have multiple towns and multiple, um, um, you know, um, not necessarily cities if it's a, mu a municipal district, but think about what 
what towns and what communities your schools actually serve and work with. You might also think about some of those other entities within your community that are also serving students. You know, I, I know Jenny posted the question and I can think of, you know, a few organizations within the community of the Lewiston Auburn area that serve students in addition to the school system. And those are the stakeholders that you want to engage with, right? Because ARP is really trying to have a huge impact on our students who are furthest from the opportunity. So being sure to potentially collaborate, but also be aware of what the funds are uh, serving and doing within the school to be able to have the greatest impact. Yeah, Jenny put some other thing, uh, other pieces in there too about like your any of your shelters, your um, immigrant organizations, any kind of agencies, um, any kind of if you have any, um, you know, homeless organizations that help work with homeless students, any migratory, um, you know, students, um, any, you know, if you have any uh, refugee population groups, um, you know, think about that as well. Um, any kind of organization that works with students in your community or families in your communities, you might want to reach out to them and see if they have any input as well. And in the same token, there's a follow-up question there, Monique, my apologies, um, in regards to if the checkbox is not sort of identified on the application, will the application be returned to you? This is an assurance that you are doing your due diligence as a district to engage with the stakeholders that are reflective of your school community. So we will not go back and say, you did not check the box for migratory students, please go ahead and check that because you are the only one who can identify what your school community looks like. Just being sure that you have evidence and documentation of the meaningful consultation that you've engaged in. So if an audit or when an audit comes down the pike and we are asked at the department level to show why X group may not have been engaged in in student in district Y, we have you as a resource to be able to say this community engaged with the stakeholders that reflect their community and you can see this here in the evidence that they've provided. And, and I wasn't going to get to that yet but um, the U.S. Department of Education is already working on uh, the report back that we're going to we're going to have to um, have for them. So, kind of like stay tuned for that. So, a lot of what the way this application is designed is also for reporting back. And um, we got some information um, this week about what that report back might look like. So, just um, stay tuned for that as well. So I check the chat real quickly here. Okay, so again, once you've had that meaningful consultation with your stakeholder groups, the ones that best you know match your community, and um, again, like Shelley said, we're not going to say, "Oh, you didn't have a migratory, you didn't check the migratory box." We're going to assume that's because that wasn't um, a, a stakeholder group that um, that you had in your in your community. So once you do that, you're going to come up with your overall priorities and consultations. Um, we're asking that you pick two or three um, priorities for your SAU. Um, and this is what your most critical needs are um, based on your consultation with your stakeholder groups. Um, and so you're going to write those down. Um, this, box, this box actually extends as you write in it. So it may look really tiny. It will get larger as you write in it. It's a narrative box. So it'll be the, it will be the length that you need. Um, um, but we do ask, try to think of, try to think of also a brevity or like you don't want to have this big long paragraph. And then when you have to go back to report on it or see if you were, um, you know, what was the impact of what you decided to do, you want to make sure it's, it's going to be easily reportable. Um, and your data source, um, I put a little bullet down at the bottom there. So if this is your priority, um, you, know, you really want to work on the loss of, of, um, of instructional time and you know that students have been impacted. You want to get students back up to where they need to be. Think of your data source. What are you going to use to be able to determine if, that, if, um, if you were able to meet that, um, that priority, if you're able to address that priority. Um, 
And then your stakeholder groups. What stakeholder groups are you going to target with that priority? And also what stakeholder groups did you consult with when you were when that priority was um, decided? Um, your stakeholder groups really should align with your community demographics. So if you don't have any migratory students, obviously you're not going to do that. But if you do have migratory students, you do really want to think about how um, if they were um, impacted by um, COVID-19. Think of your vulnerable student um, groups and also those that were disproportionately impacted by COVID. So these are all things you want to think about. And this you're gonna probably spend some time on this and that's why you know, it's July, this application's not due till September. So, you know, think about how you wanna, how, how you're going to get all this um, done in, in that time. Um, because everything you do is gonna tie back to your priorities um, and what groups that you work with to create those priorities. You're not going to be, I mean, uh, Jenny, if you hold on to your question, I'm going to get to that um, at the next slide. Is there any other like questions about this piece? Okay. So once you've created your priorities, you've done your meaningful consult, well, you've actually done your meaningful consultation, then you've created your priorities, you've thought about how you're going to uh, measure and see if you've received successful using your data sources, who your stakeholder groups were, uh, are people in your stakeholders groups. Um, then you need to make sure that your SAU plan for return to in-person instruction and continuity of services. So you wanna make, that's the second piece of ARP. So again, this is really tiny. Please do not try to read this. <laughs> um, it's just to give you a visual reference of what it's gonna look like. So when you click on that, you're going to see um, the plan for safe return to in-person instruction. Um, there's a bunch of questions here. Uh, we're gonna ask you to verify that you have um, reviewed your plan um, in the past six months, um, that describe the process for how you did that, um, and um, I can't even, and just some other questions about it. We are not going to ask you. We are we are not requesting your plan. You don't have to submit your plan to us. Um, you don't need to rewrite your plan. You don't need to revise your plan unless through the review process that 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 that's what came about. So when you went out to and you reviewed it, you had your you had some public input. You had your stakeholders um, review it. If and if you've decided that you need to update your plan and revise your plan, then you can, but we're not requiring that. All that's required is that you review your plan within six months and that you, um, you revise as necessary. So again, in the blue, we've noted that um, you need to have evidence that you've had that meaningful consultation, that you've worked with your stakeholders and that you've provided opportunities for public comment. When you sign off on this, when you click those boxes, when you write in the narrative, we're, we're going to make the assumption that you have the evidence that shows that um, if you get audited, we are going to you are going to have to report out. Uh, we're not sure what that's going to look like yet, um, exactly. But everything in here is basically you're giving us an assurance that you've done all this. Um, I'm sure that Shelley's wants to speak a little bit on this. Um, I'm sure I missed some pieces here, but again, we're not going to ask you for the for this plan. Um, we're just going to assume that you have it. It's up to date. Um, you reviewed it, and uh, you have evidence of that. And I think we just want to be sure that you are aware of the requirements of the law and the interim final rule, which is why we try to try to link it back so that you have the source that is being required of the SEA, but also of the SAU. So you have all of the components within both the law and the IFR that are required. And at our level, at the de department level, the main Department of Education level, we have to confirm that this work is being done. So we are asking you to illustrate how that work is being done. And these are the questions that we've determined are the best way to be able to say they have a plan that is publicly available, they've obligate you, they've engaged in public comment, they are constantly reviewing and thinking about what that plan looks like and then really designing this application to meet, to meet the goals of your students. Yeah. 
Um, and then this is the new piece, this is kind of the new piece of, um, of ARP SO3, and that is the reservation for the 20% um, that you have to set aside. So I just want to go back. I just saw a question pop up in the chat about requiring, this seems to suggest that masking, distancing, symptom screening will be required for the upcoming school year. That you need to go back and look at your SAU plan for return to in-person instruction and the continuity of services. So the department is not going to require any kind of um, you know, a, a mitigation you need to, your district or your SAU is going to have that written in your SAU plan for a safe return to in-person instruction. And all that's going to be in there. Any of the masking requirements, all that piece should be in your plan for return to in-person instruction. So it sounds kind of like, but we have this requirement. The requirement is that you have a plan for safe return to in-person instruction. If you want to know what recommendations need to be in that plan or what needs to be in the plan, that's when you're going to go back to um, the law, you'll go back to um, the IFR, you'll go back to the COVID-19 handbook. Um, I think it's volume one, which really spells out a lot of the um, safety protocols and safety recommendations. I think there are some also mentioned in the um, COVID-19 handbook, uh, volume two, these are both put out by the US Department of Education. So, you know, to kind of answer, go back and just reiterate that it's not suggesting masking, distancing, symptom screening. That's all going to be written in your plan. So whatever's in your plan, that's what you're going to follow, if that makes sense. And Chile, I don't know if you want to speak a little to that again or um, clarify a little bit more. So again, these are components of the IFR that are requirements of our SAUs to engage in. So if you visit the IFR, you will find little Roman numeral I is exactly from um, I would love to tell you that I can tell you exactly where it is in the IFR, but it's, you know, down within your SAU uh, return to in-person instruction plan. So that is those two items in question number five are directly from the IFR. This is not something that we at the, at the main department of education has determined that in regards to ARP that these are requirements. These are items that have been set forth by the US Department of Education. And if you read the language within the IFR related to those two Roman numerals under question number five, it will indicate that it's recommendations by the national CDC. So thinking about what the recommendations are from national CDC and knowing that your return to in-person in plan needs to at least meet those requirements of the national CDC. The main Department of Education will inform our school districts, but that is very separate from this ARP ESERF application. It's two different entities, right? These are federal funds, and we need to be sure that you folks are abiding by everything that is out of federal requirements. So, to get to the selection, um, so your 20% reservation project, again, this is a requirement of ARP, that you have to set aside 20% of your total allocation. Um, and it needs to be focused on how you're going to address the impact of lost instructional time because of COVID-19. Um, we have that paragraph in there that comes directly from the law. Um, and they mentioned specific um, you know, evidence-based um, interventions that you can use. But you can also click and go to the U.S. Department of Education's COVID-19 Volume 2 Handbook, which gives you um, more um, evidence-based interventions that are allowable. Um, we went ahead to try to um, help you out, and we created, like, we kind of pre-populated a list that we know um, is considered, is approvable. Um, and it will also help with the reporting requirements um, that, you'll, that we'll have to do um, later on. Um, I'll be, I'll just in full transparency, we did get some information from the department yesterday um, from the U.S. Department of Education, and there are a couple in here that, that are a couple of missing on the list. So um, if we have time, we'll try to add those to the list, um, just I think a couple or two or three. But if you go and you read the handbook, 
um, or if there isn't one in here that um, is what you want to do, um, we can work with you on that as well. But I think there were a couple that um, were left off the list, but we didn't know that. And so uh, we saw the list that was put out by the Department of Education, US Department yesterday. Um, these are allowable evidence-based. So you, again, it'd be quick and easy if you just check that box. Um, I just want to caution other. Um, from uh, back in my ESCA world, and Shelly would know this, we didn't like other uh, because uh, we wanted to make sure that it uh, met the um, intent and purpose of the law. So other is for evidence-based interventions that we that have, are not already listed here. Um, and that we you need to refer to the US Department of Education's COVID-19 handbook, it's volume two, which has other evidence-based interventions. Um, I just wanna caution that it's not where you can just list everything under the sun here. Um, and I'm gonna talk about it in the next um, slide or in a couple next couple of slides and I need to probably hurry up a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna run out of time. Uh, so I can go ahead and uh, go to the next slide, Shelly. So this again is your 20% reservation project. Um, once you click on the project or the intervention, the evidence-based intervention that you're going to use, it'll auto-populate number one. So we chose, I, you know, this one was credit recovery. You're going to check the boxes of the grade levels that this is going to, um, this is what this intervention is targeting. I do caution, I did have a go in and read one, somebody had, a district had submitted their application already. And they put credit recovery and they checked every single box. Typically credit recovery is for ninth through 12th grade. So make sure that the intervention that you are using is the grade level is appropriate for that intervention. Pre-K doesn't usually have credit recovery. So um, think about that as well. Um, summer programming could be all grade levels or you could just be focusing on your ninth through 12th for summer programming. It really depends, really think about how, what, that, what that intervention is targeting. Um, also think about your, uh, your, your particular student groups that you are targeting with that intervention as well. Um, if you know that you know, your migratory students have really been impacted by COVID-19 and your credit recovery is gonna focus on those students, then you check that. If you don't check other boxes, we're not gonna be like, hey, why didn't you check the African-American uh, box? We're just going to say that was something, this intervention is focusing on migratory students. You might wanna also go back to the second bullet on slide 13. Remember, these are for your most vulnerable student groups and for the ones that have been the most disproportionately impacted by COVID. And then um, the other number three is about, um, you wanna give us a description of what you're going to do. What is that credit recovery program gonna look like? What's it gonna entail? Um, and then what is your budget going to be like? And is it going to be spread over a couple of years? Remember, you have until September of 2024. That's including the tidings amendment um, to spend these funds. So you may have a two year plan. You may have a one year plan. You may have, you know, um, you know, a six month plan or something like that. So put that in there. How much is going to cost um, in a description of that? What is that credit recovery going to entail? We're going to hire teachers. We're going to use a program. We're going to use a software program, that kind of thing. And I could, I'm probably going to talk a little bit more about this, hopefully at future, if, we, if needed at future webinars. And then four, um, this one you really wanted, this is how you're going to assess the impact. So that's the, you go back to your data source. Um, how are you going to know if this um, impact, if this intervention was, um, had the impact? Did it really impact um, student um, pr progress? Um, and if you wanted to have credit recovery, did this uh, plan? or did this intervention actually impact that? Um, this is something that's probably gonna be reportable. So think about that as well. How are you going to uh, report out on the impact of this intervention on the particular stakeholder, um, particular student groups, both grade level and um, the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the ethnic or racial um, subgroup as well. Um, and then you have the res you have your budget. So you want to go in there and you want to talk about um, how much it's going to cost for each of those pieces within that intervention. If you're going to hire teachers, put that in there. If you're going to do some online programming, put that in there. If you're going to need any supplies, um, just like with other um, object codes, 
don't use the com don't do commas or periods because that will mess up your numbers. Just put in the number. Um, if you go in there and you decide that you don't want to do credit recovery after all, and you going back in there, you can delete your projects and create new projects. Um, there is a budget tracking at the bottom of the of the twenty percent reservation, so it'll let you know if you haven't used up all your twenty percent. It won't let you submit if you haven't done twenty percent of your allocation. And then just make sure you save your project before moving on to the next uh, project. Now, I know I'm going to get this question. Yes, you can use more than twenty percent if you're if you after your stakeholder groups have met and you've decided we're going to take we're going to take all of our fifty percent of our funding and we're going to put it toward um, the lost the um, to address the impact of lost instructional time. You can do that. Twenty percent is just a minimum, so keep that in mind as well. I know there's some questions in the chat, but I'm going to come back to those because you want to just finish up this real quickly here. Um, and then whatever you have left over. So if you decide you're going to, you have to do that 20%, whatever's left over, um, you're going to create other projects with that left with those leftover funds. So um, let's go to the next page there. So Say you decide you're going to pay 25% for the lost instructional time. That's going to be your. Um, that's what you're going to spend, and you're going to have 75% of your funding left over. Then you need to decide what the um, what you're going to do with that with those left, with those remaining funds. These projects still need to be allowable. So what we did again was we created a, an already made list for you, and so you're going. If you think of the project or what you're going to do with those funds. It needs to align one, one, with one of the allowable uses. The project should be focused and not a compilation of all the activities, purchases, and services. And again, I'm gonna jump down to other because this isn't a smorgasbord. You don't have to like throw all of your activities into one project. So if you pick other, it's specifically because it's not listed on here. If you decide to do um, uh, install a ventilation system, that should be its own project. And you're going to check that it's to improve air, door, indoor, um, air quality. Don't click other and then say, oh, we're also gonna do credit recovery. We're also gonna do summer programming. Make credit recovery a separate project. Make summer programming a separate project. Um, if you're going to hire a school nurse so you can help with mitigation and all that stuff, make that a separate project so that it can have its own allowable use. Um, don't like say, oh, we're going to do this. You don't need to take all your projects and put them under one and then do other and list everything. Um, do separate projects if they're not related. If it's summer programming, that actually encompasses a lot, but try to pick one in here um, that matches it, if that makes sense. And again, part of this is for reporting purposes because they're going to ask us like how much of your funds were spent on um, improving air quality. Um, and we don't want to have to go through the narratives to try to figure that out as well, if that makes sense. Um, I think we can move on. Yeah, and again, you want to create a unique title uh, for your project. So um, whatever that's going to be. Um, two will be auto-populated based on what you select as the allowable use on the previous page. Um, again, like with the 20% set aside, you want to give us a project description. Um, and then you want to give us a timeline if it's you know, how you're gonna spread the funds out. Um, and then you're going to do, um, if you, and four, you're gonna do whatever you need um, to um, complete that project. And then five, you're going to do your budget. And I apologize, I know I'm going fast, but I did preface that there was a lot on this. Um, and then last is your budget summary. Um, and like with previous GEMS programs, this is all populated based on what you put in your project budget. So you're not gonna be able to change anything on this particular page. If anything doesn't look right or anything is in red, you gotta go back to your projects and make the adjustments in your projects and your project pages. Um, and again, um, and if anything is not right, if, you're, if you haven't spent all your money or your percentages are off or something doesn't look right, you'll get an error message down at the bottom. They'll be in red. And it'll tell you, like, you haven't spent all your funds or you're overspent. Um, and then there's just a note at the bottom of this just to remind you that 
the September of 2024 is including the tidings amendment. So um, it's not like you're going to, oh, we're gonna have another year. Technically, no, it should be, it, your funding will be over 20, um, September of 2024. So keep that in mind um, uh, when you're thinking about how you wanna use these funds. Um, and then I think, I will go back to the questions. I just wanna finish this up. And then when you're all ready and you have everything is done correctly, you're gonna have check marks under uh, uh, um, next to each section of the application. And you'll have a blue message at the bottom that says you're all set. Um, and then you'll go up to the submission um, um, tab up there at the top and, um, and you will be able to submit your application. Um, you will need to download the um, ARP um, three application for viewing. This is just to give you another chance to, re to re uh, review everything and look at it before you um, submit it. And then you'll go to the email electronic signature. You'll click on this. This will be sent to your superintendent for, um, for your superintendent to sign off the ver their certificate, they're certifying the application. Again, you might wanna go back and check your application um, set up before you do this, because if, you're e if your superintendent's email is not correct, then your superintendent's not gonna get this um, certification email. So that's um, something to think about. Um, and the, the last page is just less, is just information. Um, these all are links to the actual application uh, instructions. We have the law link. We have um, the ARP uh, website that's on the U.S. Department of Education. We have the interim rule. Uh, we have the uh, U.S. Department of Facts document. Um, and then, of course, we have our own website as well. And then here's our contact information. So I'm gonna run through the um, chat questions and see which ones I can address. Um, and I don't know if Karen and Shelly wanna jump in at any point while I, um, cause I got a little bit behind on the chat. So um, I'm gonna look at the chat real quickly. And I was trying to respond to some of the questions as well. The one that I was working on currently is in regards to the comprehensive needs assessment. That may be a great starting point for some of this work since the CNA is updated annually it also analyzes student data. It takes into consideration um, your school community. It talks about goals and outcomes for the upcoming year and how to address those. I think the component that I would just be mindful of is the CNA may not be directly related to the students furthest from the opportunity. So really thinking about the focus and the intent of ARP ESER funding which is really to be sure you're drawing your attention to your, the students who are underserved and potentially underrepresented. So just kind of keeping that in mind when you're working on anything related to ARP ESERF. And again, sorry, sorry, Molly. Um, and again, to think about it as in an overarching theme, right? We talk about academic, social, emotional, and the CNA may not dive down as directly to those other subcomponents of ARP that are being focused on due to the to a nationwide pandemic. A, a bit ago, Jenny asked about um, wanting to hear more clearly what you said about being able to invoice and the 20% requirement. So she has a question in the chat that reads, can you repeat what you just said? It was about five minutes ago about not being able to invoice until 20% requirement is met. She misheard so, some of that. Yeah, so you're not gonna be able to invoice until your application has been approved. So your application won't be approved. If, well, first of all, you shouldn't be able to submit your application if you haven't met the 20%, um, if you haven't budgeted that 20% um, reservation. So it's kind of like a tiered piece. So if you haven't, if you're, when you're going to do your application, you shouldn't be able to submit your application unless you have um, allocated or put a, um, had that 20% reservation. Then the next piece is that your application won't be approved if you haven't met that 20% reservation. So, and then you won't be able to invoice until your application has been approved. So it's kind of like a, there's like a, there's tiers in there. Hopefully, you shouldn't get to the point where you're invoicing because then our system is broken down because you shouldn't be able to. Uh, um, submit your application 
if you haven't, if you don't have that 20% reservation um, in your application. Um, and I think, Shelly, I think you addressed the question about, um, uh, so about the federal and state recommendations and requirements. Um, you need to remember that the IFR is pretty clear about what your SAU plan for in, return to in-person instruction should include. So if you don't have that in your in your SAU plan for return to in-person instruction, when you so when you check that box on the assurance that you're saying that it does include the requirements or what's in that IFR. So kind of think about that as well. And I think um, that Shelly, you respond to that. Um, yeah, so when you accept these funds, you're, you're, you're saying you agree to all the requirements that are set out in the law and also in the IFR. So just keep that in mind. So if your local does not allow you to um, agree to that, then that's something you need to think about because when you accept the funds, you're agreeing to those requirements. That's the assurances page. There's a question in regards to slide 21 and the remaining ARP funds. Yeah. And, uh, learning loss. And please note that that allowable list from slide 21 is directly from the law. So those components that we've identified in a bulleted list is verbatim from the law. So we're really trying to be sure that your projects are tying into the intent of the law. And that is why it indicates addressing learning loss there as well, because it obviously is one of the allowable uses of this fund for ARP ESERF. And so also think about it. You, if your if your twenty percent reservation is specifically focused on, say, elementary students, and there, that's what your community, that's what your stakeholder groups, that's what your meaningful consultation has said, we're going to put our 20% reservation on, you know, our fourth and fifth grade students. But then you decide you want to take some outside of that, you want to also maybe do some um, learning loss with your, um, you know, with your seventh and eighth graders, that could potentially be a different project. So think of that as well, like it de depends on how you're going to set it up, you could lump it all into one, or you could separate it out, and um, that might be what your community decides to do um, when you've had that meaningful consultation. So, and again, as Shelly said, we literally just listed everything that was in um, the law to so that you can see what actually the language in the law um, allows. And that feeds into the next question, Monique, about the 20% reservation and having sort of multiple, multiple components. So if you are thinking about uh, different strategies that you are going to use to address learning loss, you want to think of them as just that, different sort of buckets and projects that you're working on. And I'll be very transparent and tell you why we would like those to be as separated as possible. So if you're thinking about extended learning day, you may want to create that as a project, and then you may want to create your high dose tutoring as a separate project or your summer school or your extended learning year as a different project because right now we do not know what the data is going to be required when we do reporting on your behalf. And we do know that these components under the reservation for learning loss are directly from the IFR and the law. So we sort of see the writing on the wall that we are going to need to identify how many SAUs in our state are supporting through high dose tutoring, how many SAUs in our state are providing um, an extended learning day. So we want to be sure that we have the ability to pull that directly from the application, not to put undue burden on you folks to have an additional report, to fill out another survey. So we're trying our best to sort of foreshadow what they're going to ask based on the law and the IFR. And, you know, there is potentially an opportunity that we will need to reach out to you and say, we need additional information, but we've done our due diligence to try to the best of our ability to foresee what that would be. Um, there's a question in the chat about, um, 
about, and I think you just addressed that about the 20% reservation um, and have multiple checkbox. Again, for that, if nothing else, for the reporting piece, try to think of it as that. If you're, you know, if you're going to do extended learning as your 20% project, then make that your 20%. And if you're going to do summer instruction, you might do that as a separate project underneath the remaining amount uh, because it will help with, if nothing else, it'll help with your reporting. Um, and, um, you know, that might be thinking, are we doing high dose tutoring? So I, again, I know Shelly just mentioned that, but I you know, just want to stress that as well. Um, there was a question about, can we go under contract now for improving our air, our air quality before being approved? So, I mean, this Karen might be want to jump in here. I know some people, some districts have been doing this under their SR2 funding as well. So uh, think of that as well. Um, so, you guys all received your GAN, so you do have you can obligate your funds to do projects that are allowable. Um, but what happens if you do that without having approval? You're kind of taking on the, the little bit of the risk now. You have kind of like think about the pre award cost. You kind of give it. You've been given like pre award cost, um, but with the understanding that whatever you're going to invoice for will still be an allowable use when your application is approved. Um, most ventilation is going to be approved. We know that's allowable use, but we're just putting that caveat up, out there. So if just know that if you are, um, you know, incurring expenses before your uh, application has been approved, just, you know, have that piece of caution to know that, you know, hopefully it'll get approved, but it may not. So just keep that in mind and, and go back and look. And if you have questions about would it be allowable, you know, consult with, you know, contact me or anyone on the team, or you know, go back and look at some of the resources, the law or um, the handbook to make sure that it would be allowable use. I did notice another one about invoicing and invoicing will be project-based. So you will, as a business manager and an applicant coordinator working together, you will identify each budgetary category for each project. And the budget manager will use the information that's provided from the applicant coordinator to submit invoices. And you can submit invoices for multiple projects in multiple budget categories. So let's say you run through a summer program and you have a little bit related to summer programming and you've already started the new year and you're working on a project associated with high dose tutoring, you can, put, you can invoice for both of those projects at the same time within the invoicing system. Please note that project-based invoicing is different and a, a new structure compared to what our um, CARES and CRISA ESER funding is currently structured. So just thinking about that and how to support your budget manager, make sure that they have the information that they need to be able to appropriately invoice to the right project. So there's a question about um, the 20% reservation in multiple boxes. So you can have multiple projects within the 20%. It's just gonna be, like we're thinking more holistically, like you're going to have a project, it's gonna be one project, it's gonna be 20%. But I think the way the system is set up that you could have like two projects and together they're 10%, I mean, they're each 10%, but together they make 20%. So you could, or you could have, you know, let me do my math here. You could have four projects and they're each 5%. Um, as long as it equals 20%, you could have all that underneath the reservation. It is set up like that, Shelly, right? Yeah, so you don't just have to have one 20% project. You could split that 20% up between four projects and then it would just all be housed underneath that 20%. You would just have to, you just have, it would be four separate projects with under the, um, the 20% or within the 20%. And just a friendly reminder that that 20% reservation is a minimum. Minimum, so yeah. For selecting to do multiple projects that are addressing learning loss, you can have, 10 or so projects, if that's how you structured your work within that reservation, and it could be 80% of your allocation. The minimum is 20%, and the system, the GEM system, has a logic on the back end 
that will only allow you to submit your application if you've met that 20% requirement. And that could be through multiple projects, just as long as they're underneath that reservation category. As Monique showed, there's two areas, there's the reservation and then there's the rain, remaining funds. The logic is going to calculate all the projects underneath that reservation area and be sure that you met the 20% quota before allowing you to submit. And then there, just one more question. I know we're at 10 o'clock. Um, there was a question about if we're, if we have um, other funds that we're using to fund like summer school or it may extended learning, should we mention those in our description? Um, you might just want to put it in there like, hey, the SR3 funds are going are to pay for this portion, um, but we're already using, you know, some other funds. Because what we're going to do is we're, we also have to make sure it's reasonable and allocable. So if you're putting in like, you know, $5,000 for summer programming, but you're like, oh, but we're also, we've also using, you know, these funds to, to do a whole grand summer program. It just gives us more information um, so that, you know, we have a better understanding of how you're using the funds. And I, I know it's, it's 10.01. Um, uh, so if you, if you haven't, you know, put your questions in the chat, we will um, get the, we'll look at the questions, see, um, create like a response to those questions. Um, if you have any specific questions, please feel free to reach out to me or to Shelly or to Karen, or um, you know, if there are more fiscal questions, you could reach out to Nicole. Um, and again, based on the feedback that we get, um, you know, from if I see like a lot of uh, districts are gonna need more support with actually creating the projects, I anticipate having like separate webinars or maybe some pre-recorded webinars to walk through that as well. So I think that's it for me.